Is this the best Beatles box set to date? Does Giles Martin's groundbreaking remix live up to the hype? And is the new mono cut in here better than the mighty 2014 or even the 1966 original? I'm Andrew from Parlogram and welcome to our review of the Revolver 2022 Deluxe Vinyl Box Set. Rested and revived after their break at the start of 1966, the Beatles returned to the studio full of confidence and curiosity. With more time and freedom in the studio than ever before, the songs performed and the techniques they used to record them changed the face of pop music forever. From today's perspective, it's hard to understand what a giant leap forward this album was for the Beatles. The fact that George's Love You Too was recorded on the third anniversary of the release of From Me To You illustrates just how far they'd come and how much they'd changed. Until Paperback Writer hit the charts on June the 10th, the only sighting fans had had of the Beatles in 1966 was the Shea Stadium concert film, which was aired on BBC television on March the 1st. Its repeat on August the 27th of that year only made the transition from mop tops to serious introspective musicians starker. But while the Beatles' music had changed radically since 1963, the format in which it was conceived and consumed hadn't. Although stereo had been around in various forms since the late 1950s, it was mono which was still the standard listening format for radio, television and records in the UK in 1966. For most people, stereo was a gimmick, a novelty, something only of interest for hi-fi enthusiasts or classical music buffs to get excited about. It certainly wasn't for pop music. The Beatles understood mono and felt more comfortable working in that format, especially John Lennon. And there's little doubt that the sound of this album was created with mono in mind. At this time, the Beatles were starting to take an interest in what went on in the control room and were indeed present for some of the mixing sessions for this album. But they had little input or indeed interest in its stereo mix. But the same could be said for the Abbey Road engineers, where stereo mixing at this point was just a quick job to be completed in a few hours before closing time at the local pub. And it's that slapdash original stereo mix of this album, with its hard panning, fluffed punch-ins and general lack of attention to detail, which has, for me, made the original stereo mix a frustrating listening experience. But thankfully, that's all now changed. I'm sure you all know the story about how Abbey Road borrowed Peter Jackson's D-Mix technology to separate the locked-in elements of the Revolver Master Tape, which has allowed Giles Martin and Sam Okel to basically remix this album from scratch. And with those incredibly powerful tools available to him, it would be difficult, to be honest, for Giles not to improve on the original. The man responsible for the original sound of Revolver, engineer Jeff Emmerich, was remarkably just 20 years old when he began working on this album. And his influence over the sound of this album cannot be overstated. As well as introducing new miking techniques, by recording everything hot, he saturated both the tape and the equipment, creating a kind of wall or haze, resulting in harmonics and compression which had never been heard on a Beatles record or indeed any other EMI recording. And that, combined with the Beatles' incredible musicianship, is the sound of Revolver. Now, I was excited as anybody to hear the new stereo remix, but the disc I went for first is this one, and it's the one I'm going to review first, the Mono Album. Now, people underestimate how difficult it is to make and cut a good or effective mono mix. It's not just a case of combining the left and right channels. It requires a lot of experience and know-how in sound and EQ balancing, and is, some say, a lost art. A good mono mix will have an almost 3D-like quality to it, which, if you're listening on a system rather than headphones, can be just as immersive and satisfying as a stereo mix. Most people think of mono today as nothing more than an archaic, dead format, which, given the choice, they would never listen to today. But there's just one thing I'll say to them. Alexa. Back in the 1960s, pop records were cut to make them sound as loud as possible on the worst equipment and play without jumping. But by early 1966, the Beatles and even George Martin were pressuring EMI for their records to be cut louder and with more bass to match the American discs they loved. Not wanting to upset them, EMI agreed and a significant increase in the bass level was let through on the paperback writer single and eventually Revolver. 
Cutting records back in the 1960s was way more difficult than it is today. And increasing the bass response on a record wasn't just a case of turning up the bass on the transfer desk. In 1966, that was only made possible by the invention and introduction of ATOC, Automatic Transient Overload Control. This system helped the cutting lathe anticipate how much groove spacing there should be before any loud signals arrived, and then adjusted the cutting head accordingly, therefore allowing the stylus to track without jumping. The VMS-80 cutting lathe used to cut the 2014 and the 2022 mono has an SX74 head, which is far more efficient and produces a better frequency range than the one Harry Moss had at his disposal in 1966 and therefore should and does sound superior. The original UK mono pressing was recut three times in the 1960s, but only on side two. Every UK mono pressing from 1966 to 1969 has a dash two side one matrix. Side two started off with a dash one, which of course contained the original RM11 mix of Tomorrow Never Knows which, as we'll see later on, is included on the Sessions disc in this set. That Dash 1 Side 2 cutting lasted for just a day before being replaced by a Dash 2 and Dash 3, which were produced more or less simultaneously. When the album was reissued in mono once again in 1981, the original Dash 2, Dash 3 plates were dusted off and used to press initial standalone copies. Those original stampers quickly wore out, and Harry Moss had to recut both sides. So copies found in the 1982 red and black BM10 box sets usually carry the Dash 3, Dash 4 recuts. Now these recuts sounded virtually identical to the 1960s ones, but had the disadvantage of being pressed on average quality early 80s vinyl. Now, full disclosure here, the mono mix is my format of choice when listening to this album. And since 2014, this pressing from the mono box set has been my go-to copy when I want to listen to this album. Now, I love it because it suffers from none of the issues of the original pressings, such as crackle and groove wear distortion, especially on side one on tracks like I'm Only Sleeping, Here, There and Everywhere, and She Said, She Said. So when it was announced that there would be a new full analog transfer from the original tape included in the new box set, I was really excited. Especially as it was to be cut by the same person who'd cut all of my favourite sounding Beatles vinyl from the past few years. The singles box, the red and blue albums, and of course the 2014 mono set. The master of mono himself, Sean McGee. Now, instead of just recycling the 2014 cutting, Sean made a brand new all analog cutting from the original mono album master tape, using exactly the same cutting notes as he used for the 2014 disc. Logically then, it should sound exactly the same, but it doesn't. But how different is it? And more importantly, is it any better? Now, of course, unfortunately, I can't play you any samples, but I can, with the help of my RX software, hopefully illustrate the differences between not only the 2014 and 2022, but the original too. Also, thanks to YouTube's new pinch to zoom feature, you can, if you're watching on your phone or tablet, zoom in to the images on the screen for a closer look. First, let's take a look at the waveform of the 1966 UK mono pressing which incidentally is a dash two, dash three cutting. The waveform shown in blue displays the changes in the signal's amplitude or volume over time, and each block of them represents one song. The orange color behind it is the spectrograph, and that shows the presence and strength of frequencies. In this case, from 80 Hertz at the bottom to 20,000 Hertz or 20K at the top. As you can see here, all tracks are, thanks to the level balancing and compression added by the cutting engineer, all at a fairly uniform level. The tracks with the highest peaks here are Good Day Sunshine and Dr. Robert, with the quietest track being Yellow Submarine. Now beneath that, let's put the waveform of the 2022 disc and have a look at the differences. On the whole, it's fairly similar. Eleanor Rigby is much quieter on the 2022. I'm Only Sleeping was clearly heavily compressed for the 1966 cut, but the sound appears to be much louder and more dynamic on the 2022. 
Another track which always had issues on the original pressings is Here, There and Everywhere. The original mono really compresses this track, but the 2022 lets those chop guitar strums go, and they dominate this track much more than on the 1966 pressing. The next two tracks, Yellow Submarine and She Said She Said, are virtually identical. The waveforms of the tracks on side two are almost identical in form, but noticeably louder on the 1966 pressing. Remember, it was cutting engineer Harry Moss's job to get the loudest sound possible without jumping, and it's clear he had to push these tracks up fairly hard. The spectrograph, however, tells another story. Remember, the upper part of the chart shows the high frequencies. The 1966 cut is quite dark in these areas, meaning that the high frequencies were rolled off, beginning at around the 15K mark. It's a similar story with the 2022, but take a closer look at this track, which is She Said, She Said. Those strong orange lines going right to the top are the S's when John sings Understand What I Said. These sibilants were and had to be rolled off on the 1966 cut. But due to the better reproducing equipment we have today, Sean McGee was able to leave them in. These extended high frequency elements are not unique just to this track, but are also audible on a lot of the others too on this 2022 pressing. For example, the snare sound on And Your Bird Can Sing really caught my ear and would probably have made the 1966 pressing jump if they had left it in unchecked but have a closer look yourself by pausing and pinching in and let me know what you think. Now let's replace the 1966 with the 2014 and see how that compares with the 2022. My first impression when listening to the 2014 and 2022 cuts side by side was that the 2014 sounded a little softer. Overall though, they're very similar, but the 2022 doesn't shy away from those strong high-end sounds like the 2014. The waveform of the 2014 appears a little wider, especially on side two, but there's certainly more high-end detail on the 2022. Now, over the years, a lot of people have complained that the mono mix of this album is dull and lifeless, and that it sounds like there's a blanket over the speakers. And to be fair, looking at the spectral analysis of the 1966 pressing, they're probably right. But this 2022 disc really brings the mono mix to life. It's louder, cleaner, and clearer than ever before, and I prefer it over the 1966 and 2014 discs. It is, in my opinion, the best this mono mix has ever sounded on vinyl. And I think if you put this pressing into the cover of the 2014 set, you'll have the perfect mono copy of this album. Now, as this reissue series continues backwards, as it seems to be doing, the mono mixes are going to become more and more important in these sets, and I hope that the remaining mono albums get the same treatment. However, their inclusion in those future box sets may also be one of the reasons why Apple are reluctant to repress the 2014 mono box set. You're just going to have to buy them all over again. This mono pressing like the Glyn Johns mix album in the Let It Be box set, really should be available separately. And it's not fair that the only way to get it is by buying the deluxe box set, which of course not everyone can afford. As I mentioned earlier, the Beatles were still thinking in mono at the time of this album's release. And the original stereo mix was just an afterthought and is, in my opinion, less than satisfactory. In fact, stereo mixing for this album was completed in just two sessions spread over two days in Studio 3 at Abbey Road. Now, while all that lovely tubey compression sounded great in mono, it did it no favors in stereo. Jeff Emmerich's generous use of compression made the separation of the instruments in the mix even more of an issue than it had been on Rubber Soul, and the resulting lack of mid-range robbed most of the tracks of any punch or energy. That, coupled with the mixing error on Eleanor Rigby, missed punching on Yellow Submarine, and general sloppiness on other tracks, meant in theory that Giles Martin couldn't fail to improve on it. Personally, I've had mixed opinions on Giles's previous remixes, and was nervous about this one, and I wasn't the only one. I read that one of Giles's aims with the remix was to bring the attributes of the mono mix to the stereo realm. Giles and Sam's modus operandi when creating this remix was to basically reconstruct the original stereo mix from the newly demixed elements and take it from there. 
The trouble with using the stereo mix as a template is that many of the mono mixes are longer. For example, Got To Get You Into My Life is nearly 10 seconds longer in mono. And it would have been nice if it extended them a little on this remix, or at least matched the mono. Unsurprisingly, this remix, like the others, has been given a more contemporary soundstage, meaning that it's louder and more in your face than the originals. Whether or not this is due to the nature of the remix or the mastering engineer, Miles Shoal, is unclear. On October the 14th, Taxman became the first remix track to be made public from this set, and it immediately caused an uproar in the forums. Something was missing, something which had always been accepted as part of the song's DNA. And that something was this. This is the amplifier hum on the count-in. Here it is on the original mix, and this is how it sounds in isolation. And here it is, gone from the 2022 mix. A similar issue occurred on the 2009 remaster of Abbey Road in I Want You She's So Heavy, where a click, which was always assumed to be the sound of a pickup switch, was removed by the mastering team who dismissed it as a bad edit. Removing something which isn't a technical error, like a bad edit or a tape glitch, just isn't cricket. It's not on. But does it really matter? Let me know what you think in the comments. So naturally, I felt a certain amount of trepidation as I started listening to the rest of the remix. Although I didn't receive an advanced physical copy, some thoughtful soul did send me a digital version of the whole set before release, so I've been listening to it for a couple of weeks already. I listened to the whole thing first on headphones as I wandered around the local parks and woods, and I must say my initial impressions were very favourable and I enjoyed it. Now, if you've seen our video on the Yellow Submarine song track album, you'll know that I have a lot of time for the remixes Peter Cobbin did on that album, three of which were from Revolver, Yellow Submarine, Eleanor Rigby, and Love You Too. Although the reputation of this remix has been tarnished by the out-of-sync vocal on Eleanor Rigby, I really like the remixes on this album. Yellow Submarine is especially good, and I think works better without its opening guitar strum. Anyway, back to Revolver, and the demix technology has certainly worked wonders with the sound of this album, with one of the biggest improvements being that of the stereo imagery. Now, of course, Ringo's drumming is a highlight of this album, and the remix improves the sound of his kit on nearly every song. But like Let It Be, it's Paul's tracks, Eleanor Rigby, Here, There and Everywhere, and For No One, with improved clavichord, which I feel benefit most from the remix treatment. Now let's come to the most contentious track on this remix, which is without doubt, She Said, She Said. When I first heard this on headphones, I thought there was something wrong with them. It sounded nothing like the mix I'd known. By splitting the lead guitar lines hard left and hard right, and reducing Ringo's admittedly over-compressed cymbals, Giles has given this track a completely different feel. But oddly, I found the effect wasn't as stark during follow-up plays on my main system, and I found that it didn't sound as wrong as I first thought, and I don't dislike it. However, the same can't be said for Tomorrow Never Knows. The mono mix of this track is, in my opinion, the best sounding source for this song. The original stereo mix had its faults, but it wasn't too bad. The problem I have with this mix is the panning of the effect loops. I understand that it makes for an interesting effect in Dolby Atmos, but by doing that, I think it diminishes their effect. I find them much more interesting when they remain static, as on the original mix, where I saw them as doors opening and closing right in front of me. But what do you think? Do you prefer them flying round or staying still? Let me and everyone else know in the comments. Now, I also listen to the remix in Dolby Atmos via Apple Music on my AirPods Pro. Now, it'll be no surprise that the Atmos mix is much more immersive than the stereo mix. It's louder and sounds more compressed too. In fact, I found it more mono-like, for the reason that most of the hard left-right separation just isn't there, and it made for a very cohesive and enjoyable experience. By the way, I thought She Said, She Said sounded better in Atmos. Of course, this Atmos mix should have been included on a DVD or a Blu-ray, but this time Apple have decided not to include it. But I guess they thought, rightly or wrongly, that it would have pushed up the price to an even higher level for something which the majority of people buying this set don't really need. 
They're obviously banking on more people listening on streaming services than a dedicated 7.1 home system. Giles has said he understands the complaints about the emission of the Blu-ray and will look into it, but I wouldn't hold your breath. Like many, I think the best part of this box set are the extras. One of the ones which really stood out for me was the original RM11 mix of Tomorrow Never Knows, complete with its spoken slate. Another was Take 7 of Dr. Robert at the correct speed and full ending, with John's voice sounding just like it did on Rubber Soul. The wonderful guitars on And Your Bird Can Sing were a joy to behold, and Take 2 of the first version is sublime. Then of course, there's John's Yellow Submarine demo. Written perhaps as a lament to his father, it's sung with such a feeling of loss and abandonment, it wouldn't have been out of place on the Plastic Ono Band album. The instrumental take of Paperback Writer just confirms how confident and good they were as a group of musicians. Talking of Paperback Writer, the EP which comes with the vinyl set is an attractive novelty but I'd feel a bit short-changed if I bought the CD set and ended up with a four-track CD. Now, the original UK paperback writer was cut really hot, and finding a copy that isn't ruined by grooveware is tough. But in my opinion, it smokes the version on this EP, which is fairly bass light compared to the original UK 45. Although the stereo mix on this is less compressed than the version on the 2015 One remaster, I enjoyed the One version more than this. Now, Rain is one of my favourite tracks from this period, and I prefer it in mono on this EP. The stereo just doesn't have the sonic improvement I was expecting. For me, the best stereo mix of Rain is the one found only on the German DMM pressing of Rarities. It's a tough one to find, but so much fun to listen to. But overall, my only real complaint about these extras is that they were not enough. Now let's take a look at the quality of the vinyl itself. In the weeks leading up to this set's release, a lot of concern was expressed in the vinyl community about the fact that the vinyl was to be pressed not by Optimal in Germany, who'd pressed the discs in the 2014 mono box, or indeed by Record Industry in the Netherlands, who did a fine job with the 2014 Red and Blue albums. No, the vinyl in this set would be pressed by GZ Media, GZ Media, in the Czech Republic, which in the past have had issues with quality control. This box set has a hype sticker which clearly states that it contains 180 gram vinyl. But as you may have seen in my unboxing, all of the discs in my set weigh less than 180 grams. In my opinion, the whole 180 gram thing is a red herring. I've got a lot of great sounding discs which weigh far less, like this original copy of ABC's Look of Love from 1982, which weighs just 112 grams. Or this Dynaflex pressing of Space Oddity, which weighs only 95 grams and sounds great. If it's a good recording and mastering, it doesn't matter how heavy the vinyl is. These premium audiophile copies such as this, which has discs weighing 100 grams more than the Dynaflex, is little more than a marketing ploy for you to spend more. Maybe we should go back to lighter discs and save plastic. What do you think? Now the discs in my set did need a good clean on my Loracraft before playing, but were otherwise without any pressing flaws and were, including the EP, all flat on the turntable. I've also read reports of some people experiencing inner groove distortion on these pressings, but I can report no such wear occurred on mine. I was really disappointed with the Abbey Road vinyl box, which sadly omitted the book and came only with this flimsy sheet. So it's good to see from a vinyl collector's point of view that these sets are now being put together with the vinyl collector in mind. And long may that continue. Now, as always in these sets, the book is really nicely done. I mentioned in my unboxing that I'd never heard of the author of the essay in the front of it, a musician called Questlove. He is, for those who don't know, Amir Caleb Thompson, a multi-talented 51-year-old American musician, record producer, DJ, filmmaker, music journalist, and actor. He's more familiar to American TV audiences as the drummer and joint frontman with the hip-hop band The Roots, which serve as the house band for The Tonight Show. 
Now, I really enjoyed his essay and welcome the fact that Apple brought someone in outside of the usual suspects to write about the album. It contrasts very well with the fascinating details about every song. And I love looking at those tape boxes, as you can probably tell. Now, if you watch my unboxing video, you'll know I had a bit of a bee in my bonnet cap with the packaging of this set. But I was just saying what I saw. And in case you're wondering, despite the nick on my slipcase, I didn't choose to return it. I'm sure you've noticed if you have this set that unlike a regular album, it opens to the left. Oddly, the Let It Be box set was the same. When you're used to handling LPs, it feels a bit counterintuitive. But that's not a complaint, but I'd be interested to know the thinking behind that design choice. Also, as I mentioned in the unboxing, I find this black border very funereal looking. And I'll explain what I mean by that. In the late 19th and early 20th century, if you received an envelope in the mail which had black edging, you'd know that inside would be a death notice, informing you that someone you know had died. Although the use of this morning stationery went out of fashion in the US and UK many years ago, it's still in common use in Europe, in countries like Austria and Germany. I'd be really interested to know if the art director in charge of this set, Darren Evans, was aware of the symbolism. Of course, it could just add fuel to the fire of the Paul is dead theory, but that's another story. Now, I'm a big admirer of Klaus Forman and his artwork, and have always loved this cover. But I feel this box set has done his iconic artwork a disservice. Unfortunately, the original cover artwork is lost. So ever since 1966, this cover has, due to generational loss from copying, got steadily worse and worse. And I find the reproduction of it on the front of this set and on the LP covers too, to be perhaps the worst of all. I don't mean the line drawings, they're easy to maintain and reproduce. I'm talking about the photographic elements. To illustrate that, let's take a closer look at this area of the front cover, John's bearded face especially. On the 1966 cover, which was as close as possible to the original artwork, John's forehead is white and fades into grey lower down his face. Now see how it looks when I switch to the 2022 box set cover. All those white areas have become very grey and grainy and make them look like a cheap photocopy. But what do you think? Do let me know in the comments. But that's enough moaning I hear you cry. Let's have something positive. I love this Sessions cover, which uses Robert Freeman's original design. I think it was the right choice not to use it, but it's great to actually have it in my hands. And I like the alternate shot on the back, and of course, the gatefold of the session in Studio 3. I mentioned the use of the impact font on the book in the unboxing video, but the lettering on the spine of the box itself is original and was lifted from the rear panel of the UK cover, where there's a small gap between the L and the V. As you can see by contrast, the original US cover below has all the letters correctly spaced. It's not a criticism, it's just an observation. One of the other points I mentioned in the unboxing was the cover's lack of flipbacks, which I'm sure was done to keep costs down. But let's not be greedy. This is a fine set and is my favourite remix to date, and I highly recommend it. The fact that these sets just keep getting better and better is encouraging, and I'm excited for the next one, whatever that may be. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, hi, Jeff. Oh, you want to tell me what the next remix is going to be? Okay. All right. I, of course I won't tell anyone. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. Well, there you go. See you this time next year for that one. In the meantime, thanks for watching. <laughs>